engage with us through comments, uh, check in to whatever campus you might would normally attend. Uh, let us know what's going on. Send me some amens today, all right? I'm not going to see them till later, but uh, and my spirit might feel them. And let me say this before we jump into the text. We are in different times, and I want you to know something, that I, uh, I grieve every week that we don't get to come together live, and we don't get to, to join in physical presence and celebrate the corporate gathering uh, of worship. But, but as I grieve, as I shared last week, I celebrate what God is doing. I celebrate uh, this week all the ways that our church uh, engaged uh, online and practice community from our kids ministry to our student ministry to our noontime prayer and all of you that watch. But, but listen to this. You know, I believe that Satan wanted to use this uh, COVID pandemic to create distance in the body of Christ. And I believe that, that Satan wants to uh, cause the church to feel defeated. But listen to this reality from last week, our first week of fully online services. Last Sunday, we had 39 people text in making a decision of some type in response to the sermon. 34 of those were people responding that they prayed the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus as Savior. If you prayed that prayer last week and you're joining us again today, I want you to know I'm so excited for you. We are following up with you. We want to get some resources in your hand. But 34 people last week via online church went from death to life. Four people responded that they want to go public with baptism, and we're going to navigate that, and we're going to make that happen as soon as we can within wise measures following the uh, restrictions that are upon us. We also had someone request a baby dedication. And so we're thankful for that. And then uh, this is the number that I, that, that's, that's mind-blowing, and I, I don't want to inflate any of these numbers, and I don't say this to talk about, oh, look what, what, what we've accomplished. It's what God's doing. And I know that with online uh, services, it can be tough to uh, navigate all the metrics, but just listen to this reality. Last Sunday, when it comes to the number of people that, that watched part of the service, doesn't mean they watched all of it. They may have watched just a few seconds, but they may have watched a few seconds where they heard that God loves them. But last week, we had over 27,000 people engage in some way with us online. And so I celebrate the fact that uh, what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned for good. And I know that he's going to continue to do that. Uh, today. Now, that being said, we want to jump into the text this morning as we start this series, Questions from God, and we look again at the very first question God asks, and the question is, where are you? This is what the text says in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'll read all the way through verse 15. It says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And so she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to the man and said to him, here it is, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. And so the Lord God asked the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are more cursed than any livestock, And more than any wild animal, you will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. What an interesting passage that we find ourselves in this morning. Just to kind of get us all up to speed, if you haven't read the beginning of the book, in Genesis chapter 1, we get... Uh, the creation of all things, how God made everything out of nothing. And really a lot of chapter one reads like a, a poem. There, there, there's a meter to it. It's evening and morning and he had accomplished this and that and then it leads to the rest. 
In Genesis chapter 2, we get a recount of creation, but it's more in a narrative form. And now in chapter 3, we have the great tragedy of humanity. As we know in the story, when God created everything, he created Adam and Eve to live in fellowship with him and with each other. And they had dominion over the earth as they lived together, ruling and subduing. But God said of them that you could have anything in the garden, but there was this one tree that we call the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, don't eat from that tree. And now some of us may ask, well, why did God put the tree there if he didn't want people to eat it to begin with? Well, my own commentary is that the tree represents the willful worship of humanity. You see, by not choosing the tree, humanity chose God. It's, it's God's grace to us, it's his love for us that he gave us this capacity in his sovereignty. He gave us this capacity to choose. And so that's what this tree represents. And so uh, what happens in chapter 3, as we read, is that the serpent, and you may think, if you've never heard the story, what's going on here? We know that the serpent is symbolic of the devil. It's our adversary, the enemy, Satan. And he's in the garden, the great deceiver, and he approaches Adam and Eve, and he, he does what he always does. He starts with a lie against God. He says, did God really say you can't eat anything here in this garden? Of course that's not what God said. And so Adam and Eve hear this. Uh, did God really say you can't eat anything? Well, well, no, God, God didn't say that. God only said not to eat of that tree. But what happens is when we give our ear to Satan, we end up perverting the truth as well because Eve's response is, the, is not that God said don't eat anything. He just said don't eat that tree. But then she says he also said don't touch it. Well, it was actually never a part of the equation. It may be wise, but it wasn't what he said. Of course, Satan's response is no, 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 no. You're not going to die if you eat this. You're going to become just like God. You see, the truth is, is God's holding out on you, and he doesn't want you to know that there's more to be experienced. That's what sin always is. It's, It's exchanging the truth for a lie, and every time we choose sin, we have to acknowledge what we're doing is we're believing that God in some way is holding out on us. When we lie or cheat in business, when we withhold the tithe, We believe that somehow God's not going to be faithful to meet our needs according to his riches and glory. When we uh, ignore God's covenant call for marriage, we believe that it doesn't matter and that somehow that's just legalities or formalities and God's somehow holding out on us so we know best. Sin is always believing that somehow God is holding out on us. And so Satan tells them, no, 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 God's holding out. You're just missing out on something. And so then they examine the fruit and they see that it looks good to eat, and they think about the wisdom they could gain from it, and so then Eve takes and eats the fruit, in which every man says, yes, of course, it's the woman's fault, but let's not forget that the man was charged there uh, to be a protector, and, and so people say, well, well, some men say, well, he wasn't around. No, of course he was, because she ate the fruit, and then she handed it to him, so unless she had elastic arms, which I don't think was the case, he's right there with him. He had the sin of omission. Uh, he omitted what he was supposed to do, and so they both eat, ultimately, and they realize something. They realize that they didn't have any clothes on. Uh, and so they, they sew some fig leaves together. And then I, I love what the text says. It says, then God entered the garden or walked in the garden in the cool of the day or the evening breeze. To me, that speaks of something that was normal for God. I love this, that since the moment God created humanity, he has fellowshiped with us. He stepped into the garden. I believe this speaks of a habitual pattern that God would meet Adam. I, I believe Adam would give him the daily report of the activities of the garden, what the animals were doing, what's going on with he and Eve, and then God would convene with Adam and Eve, and there would be this time of fellowship and communion. But God steps into the garden, and Adam and Eve have jumped behind the bushes. And here comes this proverbial question, where are you? As we read, they answer, they come out, and we hid because we were naked, and God says, who told you that? And Adam blames Eve, and Eve blames the serpent, and then God issues this curse on the serpent. And he also says this reality that's the first statement of the gospel. We'll get to this later, that it would be uh, the fact that there would be hostility between the enemy, Satan, the serpent, and humanity as Satan would wage war for our souls for all of eternity, for all of time. And God says that you will bruise the heel of the offspring of the woman, but he will crush your head. What an interesting passage. But what do we do with this question here? What do we do with this reality You know, I think that this question that God asks when he reaches out to Adam and Eve and says, where are you? I think it's very important because when people are lost, the first thing that we need to do is ask ourselves, where are we, right? 
when, when we find ourselves lost in some situation, to begin to find our way back, we've got to acknowledge the situation that we don't know where we are, or at least we're not where we should be. Imagine this, that today you received a phone call, and of course also imagine that we weren't doing social distancing. So you get a phone call, and it's a, a dear friend who lives out of town, and they've driven to your town. And they call you up and they say, hey, I wanted to surprise you today. And so I drove to your hometown. I drove to the place where you live. And I thought I knew how to find your house. But as it turns out, I I don't know where I am. I'm thoroughly confused. Can you help me get to your house? What's the first thing you would say? We would ask, where are you? Right? Where, where, where are you? Help, help me navigate where you are. Help me find some landmarks so I can get you to where I am. And so there's great importance to this question that God asks. He asks of humanity, where are you? And it brings up this equally important question that we have to ask ourselves, well, where indeed am I? Where, where, where am I and how do I get to where I need to be? And so let me point out three truths that are revealed in this one question as we kick off our questions from God series. And here's the first thing. I want you to write this down uh, wherever you're taking notes today. The first truth that I believe is revealed in this question is that there is a consequence revealed for the actions of humanity. There's a consequence that's revealed. We have to understand that God was not asking this question out of genuine curiosity, right? I'm going to use some real fancy words. I'm going to break all of them down. See, the omnipotent, what does that mean? The all-powerful God. The omniscient, the all-knowing God. The omnipresent, the all-present God. The immutable, what does that mean? He doesn't change. He doesn't mutate. The eternal, no beginning, no end. The God of all of these fancy words actually wasn't at a loss for where his creation was. He's not asking Adam and Eve where they are so he could be enlightened to their location. What's unique here is that As God knows exactly where they are, he asks the question, where are you? And for the first time since the beginning of time, since since all was created, for the first time there is separation between God and man. That's what's heartbreaking in this passage. When God asks of humanity, where are you? We are informed of the fact that for the first time there is separation between God and man. Man's decision to choose sin over God created distance. You know, in this troubling time that we find ourselves in with the COVID pandemic, we have been encouraged, and I encourage you as well, to practice social distancing. The premise of social distancing is that the the more we isolate ourselves, the lower the chance we have of being infected by the virus. But uh, more than that, the more that people distance themselves, then hopefully the less people get infected. So the sooner we get back to life as we know it. Social distancing, the plan is to flatten the curve of the spike of cases of COVID-19, right? Social distancing. It's a great concept when it comes to flattening the curve of the virus. But what happened when Adam and Eve chose sin wasn't social distancing, it was spiritual distancing. For the first time, they were distant from their creator. From the first time, they were not uh, in perfect communion. There was separation. And while social distancing may actually promote life, spiritual distancing always spreads the disease of sin and takes life. We need to not be a people that practice spiritual distancing. When Adam and Eve sinned, they separated themselves from God. And what's even more tragic is they then passed that separation down to all generations that would follow after them. They, they infected themselves with the virus of sin, and it's a hereditary problem. Every human being following Adam and Eve receives a sin nature. We, we receive separation from God. We're born sinners. We don't have to choose sin. And I know that can be weighty, but remember, humanity chose sin, not God. And people say, well, I should have a chance to avoid it. Well, let me just break the news for you. You would sin sooner or later. It would happen, and people say, well, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, maybe, maybe today we would be uh, living in perfection. I promise you this, if no one on earth had sinned before April 18th of 1979, I would have found a way to mess it up for all of us, okay? And so this is the reality, that because Adam and Eve sinned, all of humanity, all generations inherit this sin nature. We're born sinners. We, we don't have to teach our kids to break the rules. They figure that out on their own. No one is exempt. The Apostle Paul would write to the church at Rome that all have sinned. And by doing so, we've all fallen short of the standard of God or we've fallen short of the glory of God. We default to this pattern if not for Jesus. When God asks, where are you, we're being informed of the fact that we're, in, that we're actually not with him. 
When he says, where are you? Adam and Eve had to reconcile the fact that they were not with God in the garden in the cool of the day. They were, in fact, hiding from him. He was communicating, God was communicating that his creation, his people, were no longer with him. And hear me, beloved, today God still asks this question. God still reveals to you and I that we are not with him until we call upon the name of Jesus. I'm so thankful that God revealed to me. And for me, my story, I think he did it multiple times. He was patient and gracious with me, but finally on March 4th of 1998, I responded. I heard God call out, where are you? And I realized I was not with him. I was indeed lost. And in that revelation, I realized that I needed saving, and I called out to Jesus, and he saved me. When he reveals to us that we're separated from him, when he reveals to us the consequence, and it's not popular to preach, but there is a consequence, beloved. If we go our entire life and never respond to God's call of where we are, we will not just spend this life apart from him. We will spend eternity apart from the God who loves us and who created us. He asks, where are you? Where, where, where are we? He wants to know where we are. He knows where we are. He asks this because he wants us to return to him. And without the hope of Jesus, there is no way for us to get back to him. And so the first question God asks humanity reveals to us that because of our sinful actions, there is indeed a consequence. Without calling upon the name of Jesus, we experience spiritual distancing, and we spend all of our lives and all of eternity apart from him. As I said last week, it's not a reality that God gets everyone on the bus somehow. We've got to call upon the name of Jesus And be saved. And so the first thing we see revealed, the first truth, is that uh, the question, Where are you? shows us there's a consequence revealed. The second thing is this it's not just that there's a consequence, but there's hope revealed. When God asks Adam and Eve, Where are you? he's also communicating hope. Again, God didn't ask the question out of a place of uncertainty. He asked the question knowing full well where Adam and Eve are, uh, where they were. And, And I fear that many times when we read the passage, some of us, we've been programmed or we've maybe even been taught to read it that in chapter three, verse eight and nine, when God calls out to Adam and Eve, where are you? He's saying it kind of with a tone like, where are you? I know where you are and I'm coming to get you, right? I know where you are and I'm gonna come get you and you're not going to like it. And while it's true a consequence has been revealed, I don't think that's how we need to read the tone with which God asks the question. It's not just that he's stating separation. It's not just that he's stating the consequences. I believe with the loving heart of the Father, God calls out to Adam and Eve, knowing where they are, where are you? Because in that question, he's also communicating that I'm coming for you. Not to get you, to punish you, to, to, to cast you out of my presence, but to bring you back to me. Yes, there's consequences involved, but there's hope revealed. When God says, where are you? He comes to humanity. He comes to deliver hope. You know, I think it's interesting that, <clears throat> excuse me, when we read the, the narrative of counter Genesis chapter three, that it's not humanity, it's not Adam and Eve that go running to God. I mean, that's, that's logical, right? They, they believe the lie, they eat the fruit, they realize that something is, is wrong. And I know it's not in the text. I'm not trying to add to it. But when they realized their nakedness, something they had been unaware of, I can't help but think that in their spirit, they realized something was off as well. Why, why else would they hide from God? But I find it interesting that when we read the text, it is not Adam and Eve who run to God when they realize what they had done. They didn't run looking for God, the only one who could provide a remedy for their self-inflicted harm. I, I think of... Uh, my, my, my two dogs I have at, at our house, we have, my wife and I, we have two dogs, and uh, one of them is uh, a very small dog, and uh, she's a unique, I'll just say that, she's not the smartest dog I've ever met. Um, her name is Daisy, and there are times when I come home, and when I open the door and walk in the house, Daisy will, will run uh, to me. She'll run and, and meet me at the door. That's Uh, something that will happen. But there are times when I will come home and I'll open the door and Daisy doesn't run to meet me. And uh, I may not notice it at first, but eventually I start thinking, well, where is the dog? Why has Daisy not run to me? And usually what's happening is wherever she was before I opened the door, and I'll give her credit, she's kind of smart in this regard. When she hears me open the door and somehow knows it's me, she picks up on my manly scent or whatever, but when I open the door, wherever she is, on the couch, on 
on the chair, taking a nap. When she knows that I've entered the home, she will sometimes run to her kennel or she'll run to some corner or run under the bed. And the reason she's doing that is because she has done something wrong. She's gotten into the trash. She's relieved herself on the carpet. She's done something that she knows there'll be a consequence for. And so when I come home, knowing what she's done, she hides. That's what Adam and Eve did. But it doesn't make any sense because God was the only one who could remedy their their situation. And so don't miss this, beloved. When God asks, where are you, there's hope. Because it wasn't humanity who came crying for God. It wasn't humanity who came out from the bushes and said, God, we've sinned against you. We've broken your commands. Please have mercy on us. Please forgive us. No, no, it was God who came running after humanity. And there is no person alive that's responded to the call of salvation that on their own sought out God. Every person who's received salvation, and I'll just use my story. It wasn't that March 4th of 1998 that that somehow I realized on my own that I was apart from God, and I cried out to God on my own volition. What happened to me very specifically is God revealed to me that in fact, even though I had been in church my whole life, I wasn't saved. I felt it was as as close to audible as I've ever heard God speak, and it wasn't me seeking God initially. It was God calling out to my heart saying, Chris, you are far from me. Chris, where are you? And despite all the church and all the religion and all the Bible that I seem to know, I found myself asking this question, where, where am I? And I wasn't with God. And so he asks us this question and he asks us because there's hope laced within the question. There's hope intertwined in the words of the question. God is the one who comes after us. We do not come after him. He seeks us. And here's the hope in the dreadful situation. God didn't throw his hands up in the air and say, I'm done with these people. When Adam and Eve sinned, God could have just vaporized all of creation and said, well, I gave it a shot. The hope in this dreadful situation is that even when Adam and Eve didn't come running for God, even when you and I don't go running to God to to, to fix our self-inflicted harm, God doesn't throw his hands up in the air and leave us to our own devices. No, God runs to us. He directs our hearts back towards him. He asks of us, where are you? Knowing that we're lost in our sin, knowing that we're hopeless, but he says that I'm coming. If you'll receive me, I'm coming to save you. This is what Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, when he said that the son of man came to what? Seek and to save the lost. He didn't say that sinful man seeks the savior. He said the savior came to seek and save that which was lost. I believe this question that God asks in scripture, where are you, reveals two things. I think for Adam and Eve, what, what they learned is that they're lost. When, when God says, where are you? He's saying, you are indeed lost, but he's also saying, I've come to find you. You, you are lost. There, is conse- there are consequences, but there's hope because while you're lost, I've come to find you. Beloved, every person needs to know the same two things in this life. We need to know that without Jesus, we're lost, but that he has come to find us. Once we receive Jesus, we need to remember that without him, we're lost, that it's not our merit, that somehow we didn't become good enough to do this. We need to all know that without Jesus, we're lost, but that he did indeed come to find us. You know, I think it's interesting that in our church vocabulary, we use this word unsaved a lot. Uh, to refer to people who have yet to receive Jesus. And I say it all the time, but you know, the truth is, I was doing some research, the term unsaved in any way, shape, or form is not found anywhere in the Bible. What is found is lost. You see, I think that unsaved actually in some way, uh, it, it limits or lessens the reality of our situation. It, 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 it limits the weight and the pain and the gravity of what being apart from God truly is. It softens the condition of not knowing Jesus. The opposite of saved is not unsaved. The opposite of saved is indeed lost. When Adam sinned, he became lost with reference to God. Let that sink in. When Adam sinned, he became lost in reference to God. He didn't know where God was. You know, I've asked the question, why didn't God, why didn't Adam go running towards God, but he didn't know how to find God. He he was lost in reference to his creator, and all of his descendants are born in that condition, lost. But but we can be reconciled when we ask, when we answer the question God asks of us, where are you? When we answer, we say, I'm lost in my sin, but I need you. I know you're looking for, I need you to save me. Then hope comes in. And there's grace in this because we gotta remember that Adam and Eve didn't deserve for God to ask them where they were. 
They didn't deserve the grace that he gave them in sparing their life, just like we don't deserve the hope that we have in Jesus. But it is amazing grace. That's why we sing the song. That in the question, where are you, it's not just consequences. We have to understand the gravity and the reality of consequences. But there's hope that is revealed as well. No sinner deserves God's favor, but yet he still chooses to give it to us if we'll receive it. And so the first truth revealed is that there's consequences. The second truth revealed is that there's hope. And let me get to the last one. The last truth revealed in this one question in Scripture is that there is indeed a response that's required. When God asks the question, where are you, there is a required response. I said this at the beginning of the message. The question, where are you, forces us to to ask the question of ourselves, where indeed am I? Think back to the illustration of your friend who calls you trying to get to your house but doesn't know where he or she, where they, where they are. And they say, I'm trying to find you, but I've managed to get myself lost. And we would ask the question, where are you? They would then have to look around them and say, oh, I'm at an, I see an H-E-B, and there's a McDonald's across the street, the street sign, one says where, one says pecan. Well, oh, now I know where you are in McAllen. See, when, when we are asked of God, where are you? We have to ask ourselves, where am I? Adam and Eve were hiding from God. They didn't seek him out, but when God asks, where are you? They did provide a response. They step out from the bushes. They say, we heard you and we hid from you. We're fearful. They acknowledged where indeed they were. They acknowledged the shame of their nakedness. They didn't seek God, but they answered where they were and then God graciously revealed to them the weight of their sin, that's God's grace revealing. If God didn't reveal the weight of our sin, we would have no idea how lost we are. He reveals to them the weight of their sin, but also the hope of grace. People call this part of the, the passage in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Some people call it the first gospel. After Eve has blamed the serpent again in verse 14, God says this, it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you're cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. Verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the There's a lot of stuff going on here that I don't have time to explain. People say, well, did snakes have legs? It's quite possible. Uh, literally, the animal that is the snake um, very, very well be, be cursed because the se- serpent chose to embody that. But in verse 15, it's, it's Satan that's being spoken of, not just snakes, but also, you know, public service announcement, you should avoid snakes at all costs. But anyways, verse 15, God says, I will put hostility between you, that's the devil, the deceiver, the evil one. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. I will strike your head. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This first gospel that Adam and Eve, they would have children and their children would have children. And there would forever be between humanity and Satan, this strife as Satan longs for our souls. He's come to steal, to kill and destroy. He wants to devour. He wants us to spend eternity apart from God. He wants to cause torment There would be this hostility, this enmity, this strife between humanity and the evil one. But that that strife would come to an end because one of the descendants, which would be the son of God himself, Jesus, while the serpent would bruise his heel, Jesus would strike the head, would crush the serpent. That's what this first gospel is telling us, that the enemy, the serpent of old, the devil, will forever be at odds with humanity, waging war with our souls but there is a promised one who would be born of a woman, born of a virgin, the offspring of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit. There would be this promised one who would come and who would crush the head of the serpent, defeating him, providing victory uh, over, over the deathly effects of his work. And of course, we know that that promised one is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It is at the cross, beloved, that Satan bruises the heel of Jesus. It's at the cross that at first it seems that there's a great victory for Satan. It is at the cross that Satan believes he's accomplished what he's lusted after uh, for all of his existence, this this. Uh, status of being above God, of conquering humanity. It is at the cross that there seems to be defeat. But what seemed like Satan's moment of triumph was actually the eve of his final defeat. Understand that while there's still a battle going on, the war is over. Satan lost when Jesus paid for our sins and then walked out of the grave in victory. 
What he thought was his greatest triumph was the eve of his defeat. What Satan thought was going to be his weapon, his tool for victory, was part of God's sovereign plan for defeating the enemy and providing life for all of humanity, all those who would call upon the name of Jesus. All of the descendants of Adam and Eve could call upon the name of of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and that, again, is amazing grace. But all of that is dependent upon you and I responding to the question, where are you? You know, today we find ourselves in very trying times. There's a lot of uncertainty. I wish I had more answers to give you, but the truth is I don't. We are listening to the news and there's uncertainty. What restriction will come next? What's the next level of shelter in place? What, what, what's the next limitation that will be placed on us? How many people will end up with the virus globally, nationally, statewide? across South Texas? How many people will get the virus? How many fatalities? How many deaths will be a reality? How long will this go on? These are trying times, and beloved, sometimes it's in the midst of of great struggle that clarity comes. I love reading online the comments from many of you that call BT home, how this this time of slowing down has forced you to reevaluate some things. I've heard people say that Uh, They spent more time in the Word of God this week than they had the previous 12 weeks. It's sometimes in the crucible of struggle that we are reminded of the promise of God. And so I ask you today, in the midst of very trying times, this is a very appropriate question today, I ask you this question, where are you, beloved? Where, Where do you find yourself today? Just as Adam, just as God called out to Adam and Eve in the garden, he calls out to us today, where are you? You know, I believe that many of us today have found hope and healing in Jesus. I believe many of you that are watching this online, you have responded to the call of salvation. And so the answer to the question, where are you, is that you're in Christ. You've received the salvation that comes from him, something that can never be taken away. But for those of us that have received the gift of salvation, we may still need to ask the question, where are you, of our hope. You see, you've received eternal hope, but, but are you finding yourself hopeless today? We may need to ask this question of our joy. Joy, where are you? Security, where are you? Maybe what we need to do today, maybe for some of us, our next step is to choose not to live in fear. I want to be careful with my words. We need to be wise in these difficult days. We we need to take appropriate precautions that come under the, the, the heading of wisdom, the social distancing, the staying home, the washing hands, sanitizing, all of those things. That's wise. But those are physical responses, but the question is, what's the internal heart? See, if it's wisdom that drives these types of practices, then that's a good place to be. But it shouldn't be fear, beloved. There is no person who's received the salvation of Jesus Christ that should be fearful of the days we find ourselves in, because these days don't get to win. Trying times, uncertainty, viruses, economic recession, Terrible things we should pray against. Terrible things that affect us. But at the end of the day, they do not get to win. And so maybe those of us that have trusted Jesus, we need to ask ourselves, where's our hope today? Where's our security? Where is our joy? And we need to begin answering those questions and realigning our hope and our security and our joy back to Jesus. We we need to choose joy. We need to choose love, right? We need to choose love so that our joy may be full. We need to choose obedience today. Trying times can promote uh, disobedience. We can, we can think that God's left the building, and so somehow we can leave obedience. God hasn't left the building. He was never confined to it to begin with. And so those of you that have trusted Jesus, I encourage you today to ask yourself, where are you? Where's your hope, and where's your security, and where's your joy, and where's your fear? Fear should be in the grave because it's been defeated. We've been promised a life with Christ that calls us to, to rise above anxiety. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, it's a promise that we've been given. We've been called to rise above these things that limit life to the fullest. Beloved, what I'm saying is let's not let the effects of a defeated enemy reign in our lives today. While we choose wisdom, we don't have to let the effects of a defeated enemy reign in our lives today. And so while many of us that are listening, that are watching online, have made the decision to trust Jesus, I believe this is true this week just like I believe it was true last week. And I believe Satan hates this part of the message. 
but I believe God has something in, in mind for us. I believe there are some of us watching from our living rooms, our kitchens, our breakfast nooks, dining rooms, bedrooms, maybe in South Texas, maybe across the state, maybe across the nation, maybe across the world. I don't know where you are. But I believe there are some of us watching right now. And when we think of the question that's asked of us, where are you? What's revealed is that we're lost today. As you've heard this message and you've heard the fact that there are consequences because we have separated ourselves from God. But you've also heard there's hope and you've, th you've thought to yourself, have, have I responded? I believe there are some today that have yet to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe there are some that have yet to have their eternity secured in Christ. And so I encourage you right now, wherever you are, ask yourself the question, where are you with Jesus? Do you know that at some point in time in your life you responded to the call of salvation? Do you know that at some point in your life, not that you went to church, not that you did something religious, you got baptized, you gave money, you memorized a verse, that you went to a camp or a VBS, but do you know that at some point in time in your heart you recognized you were far from God because God revealed it to you? And did you ask God to save you? Did you call upon the name of Jesus to save you from your sin. If you don't know if that's happened for you yet, I want you to know that it can happen today. God is still asking the question, where are you? Are you responding to it? If you haven't responded, I want you to know that you can do so right now. If you want to make the decision to trust Jesus as your Savior, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now, wherever you are. I want you to bow your head and to close your eyes. And knowing that you're far from God, knowing that you are indeed a sinner and that you can't seem to find your way back, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me wherever you are. Repeat this after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And God, I know that there's nothing I can do to get back to you. God, I know there's nothing that I can do in my own power to solve this problem that I have of sin that separates me from you. And so, Father, I am asking you to save me, to help me. I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I believe that in obedience, you went to the cross. I believe you died for my sin. I believe that you rose in victory and defeated my sin. And so, King Jesus, I'm asking you right now to come into my heart and to save me. I don't want to be lost. It's my desire to be found. God, thank you for loving me so much that you provided a savior. I pray you'll help me live each day for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, that I pray, amen. I want you to know that if you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, if you believe that in your heart, I want you to know that everything has changed. You may think to yourself, Chris, you have no idea what I've got in my past. You have no idea just how far from God I actually am, or was actually. You have no idea all the shortcomings and all that. There's gotta be more. And maybe that prayer is like an on-ramp, but, but surely I've got to do something to secure the deal. Beloved, I want you to know that if you're feeling that way right now, that's just human pride. And it's also disbelief that Jesus is in fact that good of a savior, but he is. It can't be anything that we do it's only what he has done. And don't miss this. You say to yourself, well, it just doesn't seem like it's enough. Be careful, because what you're doing is you're limiting the cross of Jesus and his resurrection, and that's always enough. What Jesus did for you is enough. His love for you is enough. His death is enough, and his resurrection is more than enough. If you prayed that prayer and you believe that in your heart, the Bible tells us that's what we do to be saved. The question's posed, what, what must one do to be saved? Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. Beloved, if you prayed that prayer and believed it in your heart, if you prayed that prayer, confessed it with your mouth, you have received the gift of salvation. God has asked you, where are you? And you have said, I, I'm lost. I'm far from you. I'm separated from you. But I'm asking you, God, I know you're coming to me. I'm asking you to save me. I receive that salvation. And so what you've done today is you have rewritten the story of your eternity. The beauty of the cross, I love this. It's not just that Satan lost, it's that he's still losing. Because every time someone receives Jesus, 
it's yet another defeat for the enemy. And so if you prayed that prayer today, I want you to know that that's something to be celebrated. I want you to text friends today. If you're in a home gathered with friends or family, I want you to celebrate that decision. We're celebrating with you today, but we want to know that you made that decision. And so I want you to do me a favor. If you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, I want you to text this number, 956 238 3733. I want you to text that number. I want you to include your name and just type the word salvation. Again, that number, 956 238 3733. Send us your name and just type the word salvation. We want to celebrate with you. We have staff that are, that are going to receive that text message. We're going to respond to you. We're, we're going to reach out to you. We may mail you a gift, try to find a way to get it to you. We've got a book for you that's some first steps of a new believer's life. We want to encourage you, but we've got to know you made that decision. So would you, from wherever you are, text us that you have just prayed to receive Jesus. Maybe some of us, we've trusted Jesus, but we need to take a step of obedience that's baptism. You have yet to go public with your faith through that act. And so I encourage you to text that same number, 956-238-3733. Include your name and type the word baptism if you'd like to take that step. Again, we don't know exactly what that looks like right now. But we're going to follow up with you. And as soon as we can, we're going to schedule a way for you to get baptized to celebrate the decision that you've already made to trust Jesus. I know that God's moving and that he's working in our homes all across South Texas. And so I'm going to pray right now, thanking God for what he's done, for the fact that he has asked us the question, where are you? Would you join me in prayer? Father, I'm thankful that you've loved us so much that you asked us the question, where are you? That God, you ask the question, knowing where we are lost in our sin, and that you came to us, that Jesus, you left heaven and you came to earth to provide a way for us to respond. Jesus, I'm thankful that you were obedient to the point of death, that you've provided salvation and new life for us today. And so I pray that we would always celebrate this great reality, that while we were lost, we can be found because of the love of Jesus. God, I pray in these uncertain times, you would remind our hearts of the certainty of hope and the certainty of peace and the certainty of joy that we have in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, I'm so thankful that you've joined us online from wherever you are today. I encourage you to continue to join us throughout the week with all the things that we have available through uh, our noontime prayer each day through our kids and student ministries that will go live on Wednesday nights. And of course, join us next week as we continue our Questions from God series. Uh, I hope that you've done business with the question, where are you? And I hope this week that you continue to know that because you have Christ, you have joy and peace and confidence in him. And so we close this service today as we do each service, celebrating the fact that God's not done that despite the, the efforts of the enemy to discourage and distract us, we believe that there's still more to be done, that we're just scratching the surface of all that God is gonna do in us and through us. So from wherever you are, would you help me as we declare together today, Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. Here we go. Now to our Father, who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. And now I pray this blessing over you wherever you are today. I pray the Lord would bless you and keep you. I pray that make his face shine upon you and that he be gracious to you. I pray this week he continues to remind you of his friendship and his nearness as his countenance covers you. And I pray in the midst of uncertain days that you would be reminded of the certainty of peace that you have in our great God. BT family, you're loved.